Christmas time. I'm ready. All right, well, without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to uh, Casey, who's going to talk about redefining culture fit. Um, Pete, you're up next. Okay. Uh, so without any hands, I think I have these auto advancing, so it should be five minutes whether I like it or not. Um, so uh, culture fit is broken. Uh, the way that we talk about it and what we, what we care about when we consider culture fit uh, in popular terms is, is a broken concept. So I'd like to try and talk through that a little bit. Um, we value and, and we care about rituals and traditions. And, you know, that's okay. Um, I like, for example, craft beer uh, a lot. Um, I haven't found very much of it in Tasmania that's uh, exciting, that's soon to be fixed. Um, I love craft cocktails. We talked about that yesterday. Uh, these are things that I care about, and I surround myself with people where I can go out and have a beer, and I can go out and get coffee. Um, you know, I work at Pivotal. Uh, every Pivotal office has a ping pong table, and many people at Pivotal play ping pong. They're really into it, and they're really good at it. Uh, but we also build software. Um, so one important thing that I want to say is, uh, despite my excellent ability to drink beer, it has never been the case in the history of my career that drinking beer has made me better at solving a problem at work. And I would argue that's probably the same for everyone here. Um, so traditions and rituals are a, par a part of what culture is. And it's something that you know, we can appreciate. But when we're trying to build things together and collaborate together, I'd like us to consider more deeply what we value. Um, about ourselves and our character and about the people that we work with and we build things with and we make things with. Um, so the next few slides are things that I value. Um, and when I'm working and building and creating with people, I want to be able to work in an environment and with people who care about a blame-free failure culture. I'd like to be able to make mistakes because if I can make mistakes, it means I can take risks. If I can take risks, then I can do something potentially exciting. Those mistakes are something that we can use to grow. So I want to work with people who care about growing through being able to make mistakes, a safe place to make mistakes. Um, sharing matters to me. Yeah, um, I love sharing uh, ideas, right? Um, so uh, it's important to, uh, to consider these aspects of what makes us um, uh, good people to work with, as opposed to, say, whether or not we like coffee or we like stand-ups. Um, because uh, this allows us to have a deeper connection and a deeper, um, a deeper way to, uh, to, yeah, to connect with people. Um, right now, uh, we, as a, as a technology industry, we do talk about um, inclusion and the things that, uh, that make us diverse, uh, but bringing those things together. And if we can uh, really take some time to care about the values that connect us, that's a deeper connection which can allow us to increase our diversity and our inclusion. Um, I care about these differences because if I, if I work with people or if I collaborate with people who all care about drinking beer together or drinking coffee together or, uh, you know, being able to, uh, to go out after work, being able to go to a weekend retreat, then chances are, uh, despite whatever superficial differences you may have with your coworkers, you may, you may have the same lives, the same experiences, the same current situation. So I have children, and that means that when my children are with me, I can't go out to the bar at night. Um, and that's not really, uh, going out to the bar at night isn't something that really makes us um, work better together. So uh, I would say that uh, hegemony isn't an accident, that we can be deliberate in the way that, in the decisions that we make about inclusiveness and the values that we care about. Um, and if we don't, uh, if we don't make deliberate decisions, then we run the risk of really still surrounding ourselves by people who have the same experiences and the same backgrounds as we had. And that's not diverse enough for me. So I'd like to 
to challenge you to consider values very deeply in what brings us together and consider them uh, more highly than rituals and traditions. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Next up, we have Pete talking about F-Droid, and I have a timer working there. Hey. And after Pete is Nick Moore. Prepare yourself. As soon as I plug in. What's the definition of plug-in? Have you plugged in yet? Uh, I, think, I think the plug has to be in the laptop. Time starts now. OK, I'll just stick my HDMI on. Let's try reopening this. So who has an Android phone here? Hands up. OK, uh, keep your hand up if you have F-Droid installed. My hand is up for this whole talk, okay? Um, keep your hand up if F-Droid is the only way that you get apps installed. Cool, I'm with you three guys over there. Which of you three guys miss out on cool games because F-Droid's the only way you get apps installed? Okay, I'm gonna see if I can get this screen working, which I should. It's not on what time? Yeah, what's HY resolution, pick uh, probably Wow, that's a lot of resolution. Hooray, it's doing stuff. Sort of. That's okay, because the talk's not going to take too long once I get my screen working. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and show you how relatively straightforward, hopefully, it is to get a F-Droid repository working in a short amount of time. And the idea is that I would like for someone to come along and make a cool F-Droid repository that has cool games in it. Now. stuff. Uh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this resolution. <laughs> I can kind of see something down the bottom there. Oh, it's doing stuff. <laughs> That'll do. Let's go from there. So I'm going to go to um, my repository, which will be in Documents Talks, OSDC. What do I have in here? Lightning Talk. Right. <laughs> so what I've done is I have found that the SDL team, in fact, let's just take this here and send it to some random screen. Are we on screen nine? No. Screen six. It might be, but I don't know how to use XRandar well enough. No, it's gone. How am I going for time? All right, I'm not going to show. Um, the team who ported SDL to Android, they have also ported a whole bunch of really cool games. So they have, uh, on this screen where we are now, where am I? Here, F8. Commander Keen ports, they have Heroes 2 ports, they have Quake 3 Arena ports, they have a whole bunch of other really, really cool games. So by going into my... Um, repo directory, creating a new F-Droid repository, waiting just a moment while it's going to create some signing keys for that repository. Okay, I'm going to copy all of those applications that, I, that I, I've previously downloaded, so all of these games here are going to go into my new repository. Apologies if you can't read down the bottom of the screen there. I'm going to ask F-Droid to create a new repository. It's going to scan all of these applications here. It's going to build some metadata for each of the applications. It's going to then create a piece of metadata that is ready to sit inside a web root so that F-Droid can connect to this repository and it can download games and we can have fun times. 
So now I've got that working. I'm going to run a Python server in this repository, which is a terrible idea because my signing keys for the repository are in there. Please don't do that at home. Um, I have six, five, four. What I was going to do was bring up my Android emulator and show that I can install all of these games for you. But that was a matter of about 30 seconds, maybe 50 seconds, maybe two minutes, 30 seconds, that's fine. So it did not take a long time to do that. Um, I could copy that folder that I've just created now onto a web server somewhere. I can put that URL online. Anyone can connect to that repository, can download those games, and then you have access to all those high quality games on your phones. You can do it with any apps you want. You can do it with your apps. You can do it with other people's apps as long as the license permits it. And I encourage you all to have fun, make cool things, and then put them on f so other people can have your cool things. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Nick, you're up. Nick. Yeah, yeah. So Nick is going to be talking about uh, You've Got No Mail, and after that we'll have Scott Bragg. I don't have any slides, so that should make that bit a bit quicker. There we go. Hello, hello, testing. Right. Um, okay, uh, I have a vague intention of talking about email. Um, email has somehow, despite the fact that it is probably the most wobbly, ancient and least secure of the protocols that we use from day to day, become this apex of our security system. By which I mean you can get password recovery emails from a bunch of other things that seem secure and they go to your ISP who hopefully have some idea how to run a mail server. Maybe they don't. Also, those emails hang around roughly forever and they contain various crypto tokens and you can always ask for them over again and it ties your identity together and this has been the cause of many security leaks fairly recently because your email is quite predictable and so on. Mostly as a way of taking the piss out of this problem, I wrote a blog post a little while ago saying you've got no mail because that's a message that used to pop out of mail systems when you had no mail and I'll bet no one has ever had no mail for some period of time now. <laughs> it just hasn't happened. So the idea is this. You generate a passphrase. You take the passphrase and feed it through a key derivation function because you've been in a lot of security workshops lately and so you know that's the right thing to do with a key. Um, and you, that's your key and then you hash that and then you put through that through one of the umpteen uh, natural password generator things that turns a 64-bit number into something you can actually read and remember, and that's your email address. When someone emails you on that address, the server doesn't even store it. It just throws it away. It just says, uh, mail from, receipt to, yep, no, never heard of him, and hangs up. Unless you happen to be logged in at that very precise second when that email was received, in which case it just forwards it to you, your web browser over a WebSocket, so that you can um, read it on your screen. That means that when you want to recover your email, you go to the site, you type in your passphrase, then you go to the other site that you need to recover your password from, it makes the email connection, delivers it, you see it on your browser, you can log in. At no time is that relationship between your passphrase and your key stored, or your key and your email stored, or the email itself stored. All this stuff is completely ephemeral. This won't save you, of course, from Echelon, who can in take over the computer, but you can see that a, an email that is being sent when you're not listening won't even be received, it'll be refused. Why am I bothering to tell you about this? Because I can't be bothered implementing it myself and there's a strange tendency at these things when you describe an idea that is silly or outlandish enough at one of these conferences for someone else to go and implement it in their copious free time. So I thought I'd talk to you about it. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time, hopefully I'm under. Oh, sorry, uh, nick.zoic.org and look around or just type you've got no mail into Google, which I hear is some kind of thing that reads my blog, um, and it's on like the second page or thereabouts, depending on magic. So there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Next up we have Scott Bragg talking about you should all get your ham license. And after that we're going to have Paul. Your time starts now. Okay. Um, what is it? F5. Cool. And I've got a blank screen. 
There we are. Um, I just thought I'd uh, mention that uh, everyone should get their amateur radio licence, and it's a completely selfish reason because uh, we've got a, a great bunch of people here that like hacking on software. Like uh, some of you also like hacking on hardware. I've seen you know Arjen around with his uh, um, bots uh, earlier on, and. Uh, that's uh, a lot of what amateur radio people uh, like to do. But before I start that talk, I'm actually going to talk about something else. Because Russell uh, mentioned earlier that everyone should get involved with their local Linux users group. And uh, I happen to run the one in Hobart. We meet on the third Thursday of every month at the Hotel Soho, usually upstairs. Um, so if you're travelling through Hobart um, and want to pop in, uh, maybe give us a talk. Um, and also, if you're from Hobart, then come along and... Um, participate in uh, what we do every month. It's basically, it's, uh, we've, we've got upstairs, so we um, uh, have beer, schnitzels, and usually a, a talk or a workshop. Cool. So um, what can you do with amateur radio, which is kind of cool, and it's actually, um, I was, I didn't uh, do this yesterday when the, uh, the other things talk, because a lot of this actually I do with uh, Linux and open source software. So. Um, when I first got my license, I actually started sending memes over slow scan TV. Um, and what happens is you broadcast this at, you know, 35 watts or something like that. Um, the guy, VK5, he's in Adelaide. He actually received it. But this image appeared on a repeater, some, uh, a gateway somewhere else over in the US, and uh, then posted to Reddit. So... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's a, a bit of fun. So there, there's uh, Instagram for you. There's one app for amateur radio right there. Um, we have Slack or IRC. Um, this is a program called FL Digi. Um, and at 31 board, lightning speed here, um, you tune into a channel. All of these are different conversations. So you click on one of these conversations and you'll actually see someone typing at the speed of typing. And you can click in here and at the speed of typing, type back. <laughs> And anyone else can actually click on that and also listen. It's IRC for the, you know, <laughs> yeah. So um, with this one, because uh, this is uh, even at low power, you can actually get uh, uh, contacts over. Last week I was speaking to Poland and Ukraine and Russia, um, and that was at 8 or 9 o'clock at night, and I had a lot of fun doing that. Um, over in the US, there are people actually using amateur bands because you actually get access to some spectrum around 2.4 gigahertz, which is slightly outside of the normal 2.4 gigahertz band. Uh, so you can actually use some hacked WRTs or some Ubiquiti gears, which is actually quite open, uh, to you know, new firmwares and things, and actually start up your own amateur broadband mesh. Um, and as you can see here, they've got a, actually quite a few nodes in this mesh, and it's all fully routed uh, using routing protocols like OSPF. Um, this is one of the reasons why I want all of you to get your amateur radio licence, especially if you're in Hobart, because then we can actually start making these broadband meshes ourselves. Um, and some of these can go up to several megabits, you know, several hundred megabits in speed. Um, if you like to get out and about, who's been geocaching before? All right, so one of the things you can do is actually fox hunting. Someone else goes and hides these little transmitters, and you use these uh, fox hunting things to actually range direction find and actually go and find them. Um, and uh, so it gets you out of the house, it gets you running around the yard, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's also quite, you know, quite fun because you know, it's basically an electronic version of hide and seek. And a lot of these instruments here, you're actually building them yourself. So they're li either little kits, um, or you actually find schematics on online and, and, uh, and build, them, build them by hand. Um, if you want to get some of the very, very much coveted IP4 address space, uh, 44.0.0.0/8 was given to given away to amateur radio back in the 80s, and they want it back, and we're not going to give it to them. <laughs> so, if you want uh, some IP address space, get your amateur license, and if you want to connect some of your Internet of Things, like weather stations and things, to um, an internet gateway uh, that using things like packet radio, then um, you know you, you'll be given. You can apply for IP address space and actually get it. Um, pointing laser pointers at airplanes is bad, okay? Yeah? Ten what seconds. What about pointing 100 watts of um, two metre radio waves and bouncing it off an airplane and uh, getting someone else over the horizon? Thank you very much, Scott.
I'm hoping that some of these are going to take less than five minutes at some point, please. Um, so now we have um, Paul Fenwick, who has written a very beautiful post-it note. Um, he's going to be talking about fiction is awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Is that up? Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. No, I don't want that. I really don't want that. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm here today to talk about how fiction is awesome. Um, so I really, really, really love fiction. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that it gives me new ways to think, and it gives people new ways to think. Um, so you can watch a movie and you can go, wow, what would it be like if everything was a computer simulation? Or you could watch a movie and you can say, how could I use my knowledge of the afterlife to do a successful startup? So those are great things about fiction. Um, it's entertainment, but it gives us ways to think, it gives us new ideas. One thing which I feel is very much underappreciated is fan fiction. There is an enormous amount of really good fan fiction out there which exposes some really interesting concepts. Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality is the best book I've ever read which has had me think about the ways that I think. The Last Ring Bearer, or at least the first third of it, is an amazing book on how the truth can be manipulated. My Little Pony Friendship is Optimal is a pretty decent story um, about what happens when an AI wants to take over the world using friendship and ponies, but it's really, really good because it allows you to read Calum S. Conterrans, which is the best discussion on the nature of consciousness that I have ever read. The other thing which fiction gives us is stories. So if you've ever read or seen Sleeping Beauty, it teaches us that it's totally fine to kiss strangers as long as they're asleep. <laughs> if you've read Cinderella or seen Cinderella, it tells you that getting married will let you leave your abusive family. And um, if you've ever seen Iron Man, it's okay to be a total jerk as long as you're rich enough. So one of the things which these do is that stories influence our expectations. They influence the way in which we think and what we think is acceptable, and not always in a healthy way. So branching into psychology for a little bit, there is a branch of psychology called attachment theory. You find about 70% of people fall into one of four uh, well-defined attachment styles when they have romantic relationships. One is called anxious preoccupied. Um, it tends to be a very clingy style. Uh, the person requires lots of reassurances. They tend to worry a lot. There is another style called dismissive, dismissive avoidant, uh, where they tend to be very, very independent. They tend to hide their emotions. They don't like to depend upon others and vice versa. And if you have these two styles forming a, a partnership, it, it's a pretty terrible pairing. It's not very good for either, either of them, because what one of the persons really doesn't like is what the other person's always doing. But what you find when you do research on this is that they're extremely common. And we believe that the reason for this has to do with gender roles and how they are given to us by society, um, particularly in popular fiction. So to give you an example, um, if you look at Twilight, uh, Bella is a 17-year-old girl and she very much wants to fall in love and she very much wants to get married. Um, Edward is 109 years old. He has never felt the need to fall in love and he pretends to be a high school student to pick up. It is unsurprising that is not a healthy relationship. And Fifty Shades is even worse. <laughs> so what can we do about this? Well, one thing which we can do is we can find better fiction. Um, I absolutely adore Fury Road um, because it's an action movie, but it breaks a lot of your standard things that you see in action movies. It's a really, really good movie. Um, but you probably can't raise your kids on Fury Road. That's probably not appropriate for your nine-year-old. So at this point, I want to tell you about Steven Universe. And if you haven't discovered Steven Universe, it is the best thing ever. It is aimed at preteens, but it is very, very accessible to adults. And it gives you very diverse stories. It gives you uh, diverse family configurations. Uh, it gives you very healthy and diverse relationships. It has examples of unhealthy relationships, which give kids a chance to talk about these things and why those are bad. It has a very fabulously diverse range of characters and it even gives kids, we're talking preteen kids, meaningful ways that they can talk about consent. And I'm using that picture there so I don't give you spoilers. Best of all, Steven Universe has absolutely amazing music which is totally addictive and you'll never stop listening to it once you find it. So everybody, please consume good fiction, share good fiction, especially with your kids, write good fiction, and keep on making awesome mashups. Everybody, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. So we're saving 35 seconds here at the moment. And next up, we have, I've lost my post-it notes, oh my god. Um, Patents Rock by Ben Deckroy in the voice of developer Jack, including typos by Ben Deckroy. <laughs> and then, then. 
Your time starts now. No, it doesn't. Already has. No, I think this works. Is that working? No. Multiple times. Get a Linux. No. Oh, that works. Try that one last time. He said to do it for me. <laughs> oh, there we go. Lovely. Should work. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, <sighs> there we go. Here we go. Pet and frock when it skips through. Okay, lovely. Pet and frock. So, what are patents? A patent is a set of exclusive rights granted uh, by a state to an inventor or an assignee for his fixed period of time in exchange for a disclosure of an invention. Um, nice reliable source from Wikipedia. Um, it protects inventors, uh, promotes innovation, uh, so why am I talking to you about this today? Has anybody used a swing? Has anybody used it where you pull from one side to the other to swing in a sideways fashion? Excellent! You're breaking patent 6368227, in which a method of swinging on a swing is disclosed in, uh, in which you use a position on a standard swing suspended by a chain, a substantially horizontal tree induces a side-to-side -side mo side -side motion by pulling alternatively on one chain and then the other. Good fun, right? Illegal. Does anybody remember these? Uh, stamps that didn't pre-stick. Has anybody um, licked a stamp? Excellent! United States Patent 4300473, in which an apparatus for moistening adhesive coatings on postage material and the like, which includes an enclosure having a container of liquid therein. A plunger is provided to lift the absorbent applicator from the liquid and pass the applicator through an opening to the side of an enclosure. A closure member for opening is opened in response to the applicator movement. The applicator may be in the form of a human tongue and the closure may be in the form of a human lip. It does not exclude dogs. Dog postage? No. Does anybody have a cat? Does anybody have a laser pointer? Has anybody, by any chance, combined the two? <laughs> For somewhat entertaining results. Fantastic. You're breaking United States patent. 54430036, in which a method for inducing cats to exercise consists of directing a beam of invisible light produced by a handheld laser apparatus onto the floor or wall or other opaque surface in the vicinity of the cat, then moving the laser so as to cause the bright pattern of light to move in an irregular way, fascinating to cats and any other animal with a chase instinct. It's also patent 6505576, 6557495, 6651560, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 6557495, 
invention. invention. I keep calling the invention. So anyway, without any further ado, um, we're going to move straight on to Katie, who's talking about, uh, sorry, not Tom Eastman. I f f uh, Forgive me for giving the wrong name. Um, serialization formats are not toys. Go. Hello, I'm not Tom Eastman, and we're going to talk about serialization formats and not toys. Uh, Tom was able to travel to Montreal recently uh, under the uh, money from the uh, Python Software Foundation in order to give a full version of this talk, I'm going to do it in five minutes or less. So, who am I? I'm not Tom Eastman. Who are you? You're not Tom Eastman. <laughs> Serialization formats. Why am I talking about this? 90% of magic merely consists of knowing one extra fact. Uh, who has, has heard of the OWASP top 10? This includes serialization formats. These are not bugs that I will be describing today. These are features because any fully compliant Serialization formatter must comply with these features. So I'll be using a demonstration app. This is really basic uh, Python code where all I'm doing is just importing YAML or importing uh, XML. And this is just a very basic bottle app that's running on my laptop. So let's talk about YAML. Here is some basic YAML code. I am posting a simple response, a, a simple post, and just reading that back as a response. That's all my bottle app is doing. So what I can do is I can use a wonderful Python object here in order to instantiate an instance of the date time to put in my birthday, which resolves into a Python object. That's great. Hmm, what else could I do? I could use the same process to uh, invoke a subprocess to output the directory listing of the folder I'm currently in. Hey, I wonder if I could possibly do a OS system command and do a remove star and I nuke my entire directory. This is completely valid YAML. And Python is really awesome because you don't even have to have uh, included this module before you actually pass the, XML, uh, the YAML code because Python will do that for you. Surely this doesn't happen in real life, right? People just can't nuke directories. Yeah, it kind of happened to uh, TastyPy and Piston back in 2011, and we were all sad. And then it happened to Rails, and then we all laughed, because this is normally directed at a Python audience. And then it happened to Rails again, and it was really sad. And it happened to Puppet, which is absolutely awful, because you think these people would know about these things. And then it happened to Node, and no one cared. So how do I protect myself? Make the parser stupider. There is absolutely no reason to want to invoke any sort of RM star command. So what you should be doing is using yaml.safeload, because of course you're going to go through the um, drop down listing when you go yaml dot and go all the way down to s instead of the load that's way up further. Um, and in Ruby, you have to monkey patch it in. Fun. So let's talk about XML. Who here has to use XML? Keep your hand up. So if I'm posting an a entity, in XML, which is completely valid XML, I can have a happy face with the uh, ampersand and the semicolon at the end. That's like you do it in uh, HTML. And what I can do is I can define an alias for this element. So I can have a smile, and all I have to use is ampersand smiley semicolon. And what I can do is I can define a whole lot of smileys and then have a whole lot of S2s and a whole lot of smileys and a whole lot of S3s, a whole lot of S2s, a whole lot of S4s and a whole lot of S3s, and I can have a whole list of smileys and everyone's happy. Well, who knows what this is called? Yell it out. What is it called? Wrong. It's the 168 million laughs attack because he had to take off one lol on each end to actually have it fit on the slide. <laughs> True fact, he loaded this into uh, Emacs and it decided to parse it for him and his laptop died because Emacs likes to automatically parse XML for you. So what else can we do? You can traverse a file system in XML or you could traverse someone else's file system in XML. Please don't do this. Surely this doesn't happen in real life, right? It happens all the time, and it's depressingly so often, because most of the time, if you've got XML servers, they're going to be on a production enterprise network running as root. So how do I protect myself? You do all these things. Just a really simple list for XML. It's absolutely fine. We need to make the parser stupider. And you can do all these things, and these slides are available online. So JSON, finally stupid enough? Only if you use a stupid enough parser. Eval is not a stupid enough parser. Um, in the JSON documentation, it has, um, here's how you do the thing. And right down here, it says, don't use this. And on the same page here, it has it about here, saying don't use eval, even though it's circled higher up, which is actually stupid. The lesson, beware of flexibility, disable everything you do not need, keep it simple, silly, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, not Tom Eastman. <laughs> Next up, we have Donna Benjamin with an untitled talk. Thank you. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? 
Are you sad that this is all nearly over? Yes. yes. Do you remember right at the beginning of the conference that our wonderful hosts, Tim and Morgan, introduced the Code of Conduct? One no, mostly yeses. Excellent, I'll move ahead. Um, the code of conduct uh, is something that open source communities have been doing for a while now. Um, and uh, even now we're getting to a point where um, incidents are happening and being reported. That's the new bit, the being reported, because in the past they were happening, but they were kind of being talked about uh, behind closed doors and people. some people just never came back and shit was bad. And now we know about it. There's a next step in this story. And it's only starting to happen. And some people are doing it really well and some people are not doing it very well at all. And that is, what happens when you get a report that someone has breached your code of conduct? Hands up if you have heard of incidences and shitstorms that happened as a result of incidences being reported. Hands up if you think that kind of sucks. Hands up if you're aware that sometimes the result of the report is worse than the incident itself. Okay. Hands up if you think this is something we should perhaps try and fix. That's awesome. Thank you very much. That's what my next mission will be. And I did that in, you know, no time. So questions? No. <laughs> Thank you. I've got everything totally in control. Don't worry about me. I'm better to spill water on Jack's laptop, but I'm sure he doesn't mind. Yeah, yeah this one. Um, so thank you very much, Donna. Next up, we have uh, Fraser Tweedale talking about automated network bound decryption. Your time starts now. 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 Okay. Uh, we want uh, to twiddle the displays and make the thing appear on the screen. And uh, mirror. Okay. And and begin. So, um, this is a web server. It does web things, and we're going to bring up the server. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to system control uh, start HTTPD. And, uh, oh, I've got to put in the passphrase for the TLS keys. Well, that's annoying. What happens if the server in the server room has a power outage or reboots and there's no operator there to put the passphrase in to unlock the keys? What do you do? Well, you just put your private keys on there without a passphrase and Bob's your uncle, right? Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, server's up now. Okay, that's good. Um, but how about we have an automatic uh, network-bound disk decryption daemon running on another host on the same secure network, and my host can cooperate with it to decrypt the private key automatically. Um, this system is called DAO. So over on F22-3, we will start DAO decrypty. Uh, sudo system control start DAO decrypty. And then over here, we'll do a uh, uh, cd uh, etsy httpd dao.d, and we'll do a uh, echo my super secret password uh, into dao encrypt trust anchor etsy ipa ca.cert, and the f 22-3.ipa.local, that's the address, <coughs> excuse me, of the Dao Decrypt D server. And we'll spit this out into f22-4.ipa.local port 443. And that's done, and now we'll sudo system control, restart HTTPD. And it just came up. It just came up automatically. Okay, and if we, uh, if we, stop the Dao Decrypt D, or if um, someone comes in and says they're an IBM technician and walks out with my servers, um, as long as they don't take the one that has the Dao Decrypt D on it, then they're not going to be able to decrypt the private key and you're just going to have to put the prompt in. What about full disk encryption? Okay, let me embiggen this one. 
So here's a host with full disk encryption. Um, we can see just the single key slot, so the Lux key slot um, with the symmetrically encrypted um, disk encryption key. So we'll, on this host, do a uh, DAO crypt set up, dash A, same trust anchor, etc, ipaca.cert, f22, 3.ipa.local, the DAO decrypt D server. Run sudo that, might help. Oh, I, oh and a dash D, uh, let me just rearrange this. No, that's not what I want. I have to tell it which uh, file system I care about. Uh, dev uh, sda2. Enter any of the passphrases for the existing key slots. Okay, and it's going to do the thing. Oh no! Um, I'm able to, unable to communicate with. Oh, I didn't restart the service. Okay, that'd be why. Uh, start that. Okay. Uh, now let's do it. How's the time? 32 seconds. Oh, man. Come on, come on, come on. Go, go, go. Okay, reboot. Okay. And now we're just going to see. <laughs> we're just going to see if we can make it in time. Okay, go. All right. Okay, wait for it. Wait for it. Uh, no, no, no. I'm not going to type the password. Just wait for it. God, I hope it happens in the next five seconds. <laughs> Come on. Oh. Thank you, Fraser. It's going to come up. It's going to come up. I swear. Next up, we have Kathy. And then me. And then it's all over. And then maybe Ian, if we have time. Um, I'd like to make a quick thank you to uh, Jack, who has kindly allowed us to go slightly over. Um, as long as we don't go more than half an hour over, he's still starting his AGM within the legal bounds of when he's allowed to start them. Um, so it does mean that we can actually have our five minutes each. So thank you, Jack. Uh, after Kathy is me, and then I believe Ian wants to have a very quick word. And apparently Paul is going to read a poem to Jack. <laughs> Come on, all right, Kathy, your time starts as soon as I work out how to use a Mac. Yeah, oh, there we go. Now, now, oh, no, now, now, now. Now. How fortunate. So, OSGC 15 was pretty awesome, huh? Major props, Tim and Morgan. So, do you want to go to something similar next year, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, here's one I prepared earlier. So, LCA, Linux Conf U is going to be in Geelong next year. Geelong. Wow, I'm so glad you asked. Here's one we prepared earlier. Geelong is about an hour away from Melbourne or 20 minutes if you're flying to Avalon. So if you're on the Gold Coast or in... Sorry? <laughs> I'll ask for one. So where's it going to be? It's going to be in Deakin University's architecturally splendid waterfront campus. Imagine a 200-year-old wool store that's been converted to a university, raw timbers. <laughs> if we're a diverse conference. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful campus, lots of Wi-Fi, lots of eateries, lots of coffee. We, we have lots of accommodation in the CBD, or we have student residences, which will bus you to. When is it on? Get out your diaries, your mobile phones, your compendia. It is the 1st of Feb to the 5th of Feb next year in Geelong. Beautiful weather. CFP is closed. We already have a schedule. Sorry, you're too late. And early bird sold out this afternoon. You're already too late there. But it's so awesome that you're going to want to pay full price. So, our theme is Life is Better with Linux. We have four amazing keynotes who we've locked in, but I'm not going to tell you who they are. Because I evil. So, more info. 
And that's our website. We're on Twitter. We have a hashtag. We're on Facebook. We have email. Take note, and I hope to host you in Geelong in February. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. Now up is me, so please give me a second while I uh, my, um, wire myself up. Awkwardness for the win. I love my hair sometimes, but sometimes it just gets in the way. And sometimes my laptop doesn't work. No, you're getting out of yeah, but I'm not getting anything here, and that doesn't help me. Yay. So now switch to here and go. Wicked. So, there's this guy I met. <laughs> and he had this idea. I believe he's given you another idea this evening. Um, so please feel free to act on that one, because uh, th this guy had an idea. And he told this idea to another guy, and this guy had had a beer. And he decided that he was going to take this guy's idea and actually create it. Let me tell you about another guy. <laughs> this guy also had an idea. Um, he called it data retention. Hands up if you like data retention. Get out. Um, so this guy decided to take this guy and talk to this. <laughs> Do you want to be a guy? This fantastic person who loves to talk about Inkscape, who created this awesome logo. So squawk.cc is a registered domain, and the project purpose is creating noise as a service, as an act of civil disobedience that attacks the wholesale surveillance of Australian citizens under the data retention program. As of about 24 seconds ago, or maybe a minute and 24 seconds ago, it's at github.com slash bendekrai slash squawk. Um, it already, so this was actually my first um, pull request. It was via Twitter. I don't accept any more pull requests via Twitter. I know, so boring. Um, so now what I'd like to do with the remaining time I'm doing, so usually I really press myself for time. I'm just going to relax now, except that Tim wants to do other stuff. Um, so I'm going to grab this over here and put that over there. So um, I chose a color scheme that would be really easy for you to read. Um, but the logo's in there. Huge big thank you to, to Kathy for the logo. And a huge big thank you to Nick. For, sorry, not Kathy, Donna, for the logo. And a huge big thank you. To, to Nick for the idea. Um, huge big thank you to AWS for free tier hosting. Um, so here there's a little bit of script that you can just copy and paste into the header of all of your web pages. Um, squawk.cc slash squawk.js. And if we view the source, you'll see that up here it's including the squawk.js. And if we look at squawk.js, so we have a list of um, first part of the IP address classes, thanks to Nick, of um, most of the C classes that belong to Australia. And then I generate three more numbers between 1 and 254. And then I concatenate them together. And I create a random IP address between something dot something dot, like no zeros and no 255s. Uh, and then I create an AJAX request. You notice there's no jQuery or anything in here, so it'll run really light. It'll run without any plugins at all. And it makes a request to get the IP address which looks a little bit like this. So if we look down at the bottom here, I've made it nice and big for you. Can you all see the bottom of that screen? So if I refresh this page now, you'll see there's an XHR request to 202.130.199.183. If I now refresh the page, there's another one to 175.91.239.49. These IP addresses might not actually exist, but the ISP that I'm currently connected to is logging every single connection. Noise as a service. So please go to squawk.cc, copy that text, put it into all your web pages. There are some things that we do want to do. Um, so thanks to Nick, we've now done the uh, only make request to Australian IP addresses, or some approximation thereof. Other things that I want to do is um, avert DDoSs. Uh, so I'm, you're basically going to be putting code out there that gets every single website, uh, every single user of uh, like a web browser to hit a random website. So it's not really DDoS, it's like distributed general splatter of something. Um, but that's probably not a great idea. So maybe we'll put some limits on there. Um, another thing I want to do is emulate real usage. Um, so one hit to a random IP for every hit to a, a, a page isn't really 
accurate. I think I have about a minute left. Um, so, 45 seconds, excellent. So, making a couple of requests after a couple of seconds, randomized timeouts so that, um, that there's no real pattern analysis, and maybe using something like um, local storage to save the IP address that you hit, so you can make the same request uh, or request the same IP address a couple of times just to make it look a bit more real. Um, at HTTPS, so that you can just do slash slash and then um, it'll obscure things even more. Um, only run if the requester is in Australia. Might have to be a server-side thing, we'll work on that. Um, and then internationalize, so you can have squawk.cc slash se, so all the Swedish people can do it for all the Swedish users to hit all the Swedish servers. And we'll go from there. Poor requests are accepted, thank you for your time. Come talk to me afterwards if you want to use it. Question. <laughs> Uh, distributed denial of spooks. spooks. That's it? Yes. I was the last one. Well, well, we didn't have anything else down, so now we're going into impromptu mode, apparently. <laughs> Everyone, hi, hi. So we won't need that long, but I do need you up here. So, so this is a uh, collaborative project uh, between Katie and myself. Jack, I need you. I need you to stand up here, Jack. Stand. Oh, you can, you can, you can do this. Okay, fine. This will make it even more uh, amusing. So we've written Jack a poem because uh, he needs a, a small hand in committing to something. My life till now is incomplete. My heart sits in a hole. My sessions are all unmanaged. It clutches at my soul. Session management for my life, it's everything I've wished. And yet, the definitive guide, it still does not exist. But now, we have a ray of hope from developer Jack. He's now announced he'll write a book, so please give him a clap. So thank you, Jack. You're in my heart. You've fought away my fear. I'm looking forward to your new book, OSDC next year. <laughs> yep. Um. Yes, everybody happy? Thank you. Okay, sorry, this won't actually take five minutes, it'll take much less. Who here likes nice, lightweight IDEs? Yeah, fair number of you. Who here likes Git? Yes. Yeah, okay. Who here would like them to be integrated? No? Well, okay, here's my pitch. <laughs> Arr, work with me here. Okay, imagine these 10-year-olds who are learning to program, or even 7-year-olds who are learning to program. I would like them to learn programming properly with distributed version control built in. So imagine you've all got... Who here is visual spatial thinking? Yeah? Yeah, many of you. Picture this. Okay, you have an editor. And the Git infrastructure is like built in. Yeah? So when you create a project, it creates a Git repo. Just does it. Yeah? And you add a file in your project, just add it to the repo, and it's just in there, yeah? So, you type some stuff, you don't press save, there's autosave. Autosave doesn't commit, just does it, yeah? You don't press it. You press real save, and it said, would you like to add a comment? Just does it. So, you want to share this stuff, it will say, would you like me to commit, to commit all those anonymous commits, you know, all the autosaves, would you like me to collapse them a bit? You know, clean it up. Sure, done. Yeah, single clicks, done. So you make a mistake. Dreadful. I need to know what I did last last hour. Just browse back. Undo button doesn't work? Of course it works. It's now in your git commit. You can browse back to the beginning of time. Not a problem. It's like time machine in your project. It'll work. So a teacher needs to review how you progressed on your project. Easy, give them the good repo, they can just browse through. I would like this to exist. Unfortunately, it doesn't. 
I need help. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, that now brings us to, uh, skippingly, to a uh, slightly late close. Um, please, I, please, I, sorry for that, um, but I, you all look like you were having so much fun, so um, that's what we did. Uh, here we are at the end of uh, what I, I hope has been a, a, a wonderful three days where you've all met new interesting people or caught up with people you already knew and learned wonderful stuff and saw great presentations. And you've all been, as far as I can tell, you've all been excellent to each other. So thank you for that. Uh, I would like to also thank our uh, sponsors again, our gold sponsor, Automatic, um, our silver sponsors, Red Hat and Sousa, our bronze sponsor, Elastic. Our, am I, I'm going too fast. I should be clapping each one of these. Come on. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Automatic. Yes, yes. You guys are fantastic. Oh, um, and they're hiring. Go and work for them. They would love it if you did. Our silver sponsors, Red Hat and Sousa, are both also hiring. Um, well, I know we are. I'm sure Red Hat are. And, and you can buy their things, and that would be good too. Um, Elastic, please. Thank you, everybody. Our lanyard sponsor, Osaya. Um, Our bar at dinner sponsors, which also includes Osaya and the Open Source Developers Club and Strategic Data. Thank you, people. You're great. Morgan's turn to talk about fundraising. Yeah, don't worry. It's nearly over. What's that you say, Paul? Well, at the... Um, at the Yeah. One of the at the one of the um, talks we had previously, I uh, bought these breeding pair of geckos. Uh, and I I haven't I haven't actually paid for this yet. So do we have the cauldron here, or is it has it been taken away? Uh, it's on the registration desk. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> Ben's very good at running. This won't take long. <laughs> So I thought I'd hand over, I, I promised $200, right? <laughs> nice. Cool. So I promised $200. I'm going to, I've got most of that in tens. Hang on. So that's 10, 20, 30, 40. Those are actually 50s, right? 70, 80, 90, 100, 1. I owe you $30. I know where you are. I'll get it, okay? So I'll pay that. And this is a... It's... We're doing incredible damage to people out there. Anything we can do to help those people come through that and survive and live a new life in a new country is a good thing. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay, well, um, as I mentioned before, we're going to have a silent auction today for this dangerously fecund pair of geckos. So whoever you are that gets them, try to, you know, keep them apart or it'll be like triples, you know, they'll be everywhere. Yay, more money. Yay, put more money. Yay. Um, okay, so the lucky winner of these glorious geckos is Sven. Yay. Who generously donated fifty dollars? Use use them use them wisely. Well, my twin girls will love them. Ah, awesome, awesome. Okay, so um, we have raised roughly twenty five hundred dollars. 
uh, for the refugee centre. But, you know, there's still a wee bit of space in the cauldron. As you go out, coins change, we take anything. Um, so, But I would like to thank everybody seriously for putting up with me hassling you, for donating money for, as Paul says, this terribly excellent cause. Thank you very much. Um, thank you again, everybody. <laughs> it's, it's heavy. Um, uh, so this evening, uh, remaining events this evening um, are the OSIRE AGM that we're running late for, but we do still have time before we're in violation of um, a law. Um, and the after, uh, after, 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 after event event, uh, which Chris has sorted at Tasman Quartermasters, um, will be coming up. And the last thing that I need to say is um, it's, it's, it's been an honour to be able to put this on. I, I, um, I'm, re I'm really glad that we were able to bring all of you together here for a few days to do this thing. Um, and, but I, I'm, I know I'm the only person standing here, but it's not just me. I have to thank, uh, <laughs> hey? <laughs> Uh, I have to thank Morgan for all of the, the help with planning and, and her support and uh, dealing with venues and catering and buses and things. I have to thank Scott for getting the website up and putting up with me badgering him to fix things at strange times. Um, and also for being dragooned into being an AV volunteer and a room monitor today. Uh, I have to thank all of the other volunteers, uh, Pete Lawler on AV, John Christensen on AV, uh, Chris Barnard, um, who room monitor, uh, Pete Sawilo, who was, uh, gave a tutorial uh, and also was a room monitor, uh, Michael Emery for manning the rego desk, uh, Mark, one of our keynotes, for also being a room monitor again, Ryan Werner for just go Ryan, uh, AV, dealing with everything. So, um, all of those people who, who were, were doing things here that, that made this all happen, thank you. Um, those of you who aren't speakers, who don't have little boxes, are going to get one for our thanks for doing this. Um, they're here and we'll, we'll sort that out because some of you are still helping. Um, <laughs> Um, thank you to our, our keynote speakers, uh, Maya Soren, uh, Mark Elwell, Richard Tubb and our, our plenaries, um, uh, Michael Cordover and Virtual Peer. Um, so thanks to all of them. Um, thanks to uh, uh, Lana Brindley and Ian for helping out on the papers committee. Uh, thank you to the Open Source Developers Club exec for their faith and support, particularly Ben, Deck, Ryan, and Ian Lentz. Um, Ian for telling me to uh, just breathe and slow down when I rang him up in a mild panic and, um, <coughs> and no, that was all fine. Um, and, and also Ben and Ian for running the lightning talks, um, it's, it's been great. Linux Australia for having us run under their aegis, uh, in particular Josh Hesketh for always being there to just answer questions and be wonderful and helpful. Um, uh, and also Chris Neugebauer for giving me the rest point contact and for advice and such and, and for um, setting up the event this evening. So um, thank you to all of those people. Um, and, and, and other, other Donna um, got um, tricked somehow into doing the opening graphic -y things for the videos. <laughs> well, uh, Ryan said he was going to ask you, so it's, anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, stuff, you know, I had a random brainstorming session with Cathy on IRC uh, one night about how to promote things and how to arrange the CFP dates so that they didn't actually collide with the LCA CFP dates, but so that there was some overlap and we could do cross-promotion. Uh, cross so, and anybody else that I asked to do anything and who did, um, please tell me I haven't forgotten anybody. Awesome. Um, Rest Point, the Apple Shed, Coal River Coaches, Upbeat Promotions for the Lanyards, and my notes have run out. And all of you for coming. Yes. I'm going to take the mic off you, Tim. Oh, Ryan says the videos will be online next week. Um, so as well as being a speaker at this conference, I'm here in the capacity of being a committee member for Linux Australia. Um, for 
those of you who are unfamiliar with, uh, with Linux Australia, we uh, represent the open source community within Australia and um, have traditionally uh, been the umbrella organisation for linux.conf.au and various other open source events throughout Australia. And this year for the first time, um, Linux Australia uh, helped um, underwrite OSDC. And um, speaking on behalf of the entire committee, it's been fantastic to work with uh, Tim and Morgan. You should probably come up as well. Um, because uh, running a conference is a, is a pretty thankless task and it takes a lot of effort. And, um, but so many of us benefit from, uh, from coming to events like this. And it's uh, thanks to organisers like, uh, like both of you that we, can, um, uh, that we can come here and learn to make new friends and to, um, and to help grow the open source community throughout Australia, New Zealand and the world. So uh, as a token of our appreciation, um, I got some uh, advice from uh, someone who remained nameless on what, uh, on Tim's choice of poison, I visited Cool Wine today. Uh, so on behalf of the Lynx Australia Committee, uh, there's some stuff for you to um, possibly forget how terrible organising these things is, or to celebrate um, how running the, uh, to celebrate the success of the conference, you take your pick. Uh, and Morgan, I've, um, to help you de-stress after the terrible job of, uh, of running the, uh, the treasury. It's uh, terribly difficult and terribly stressful. Uh, two one-hour massage sessions at Obianetta in Hewenville. Um, so everybody, please thank Tim and Morgan who've done just this absolutely fantastic job of running this conference. Just a really quick thing about the after event event. Uh, there are buses going from Sandy Bay Road in that general direction if you want to get into town quickly. Otherwise, it's about a 30 minute or 40 minute walk. See ya. Thank you, Chris and everybody. It's been great. Where's OSTC going to be next year? There was a poem. Um, <laughs> Um, the, I'm, hang on. No, Kathy can't. Vera Lynn runs for Otoshong. Don't know where, don't know when, but we'll meet again. We, we don't have a um, gullible volunteer yet to do this. Um, and the when would also be a thing because we'd like to drag it further away from LCA. Um, so mid, new year with, mid next year would be good, however, that makes it really tight and we need to get things organized like now. So, yeah, talk to me. Um, oh, and um, we really need to start the OSI AGM now. Um, uh, thank you, Jack and OSI. If anybody is an OSI member who's here, who isn't Jack or it's all sorted? Please stay in the room if you're an OSI member because they like quorum. They really like quorum.